Hello and welcome to another lecture of ECE 205. So I have a lot of things that I would like to cover in this lecture. We probably won't get all through it, so let's just go ahead and jump in. Okay, so let's just recap what we've done so far. So generally speaking, we have first order differential equations of this form, where m and n could just be any arbitrary functions of x and y, and f of x is just some forcing function of the form f of x. So in our first couple of lectures, we talked about linear first order equations of this form, and we found that we could solve these by applying the method of variation of parameters, where we first find the homogeneous solution, uh, that is to say explicitly the solution where f of x is equal to zero, and then we use that along with the particular onsatz, y is equal to arbitrary function of u times any particular solution to find the solution to these type of equations. In the next lecture, we looked at separable nonlinear first order equations of this form, where we found that we could apply separation of variables to a decently large class of differential equations to put them into this form, and then we could simply integrate both sides. And sometimes we could solve for y, sometimes we couldn't, but in either case, we could find implicit solutions given that we could evaluate the intervals. And we noticed in the last example that I covered in the last lecture that there's some overlap between uh, the separable nonlinear first order equations and linear first order equations where we could modify the equation to go from say something of this form to something of this form and vice versa. Thus, this little intersection between these two classifications is non-trivial and there are some differential equations that you can solve using either of these two methods. In today's lecture, we're going to look at another class of equations, and ultimately we'll draw another little bubble down here to expand the scope of uh, first order differential equations that we can solve. So let's jump in. So we're going to focus on solving another one of the classes of these type of equations, where n and m are going to have some restrictions on them that we will introduce soon. Here I'm not introducing the restriction that we're going to be using for this lecture because seeing how it is derived from first principles is quite useful. So in terms of our nomenclature that we introduced before, one is going to be a, well, think about it for a second, first order differential equation. And we can't really say anything about whether or not it's linear versus nonlinear, separable versus non-separable, any of those type properties there. Okay. Further, note that one can be written kind of in our more standard form just by dividing this whole expression by dx to rewrite it as so, or writing the whole expression by dy to write it as so. And further, kind of looking at either of these forms, all linear and nonlinear first order differential equations can be written in this form. A good exercise would be to go through and try to show how the two classes of equations that we've looked at previously can be rewritten into one of these two forms. It's pretty trivial, but worth your while to do that. Further, since the, these uh, equations contain nonlinear first order equations, like nonlinear first order equations, this equation one might not have a general solution, so it could be stuck with an implicit solution. And there's some initial conditions for which we can't actually solve the initial value problem, like we've seen in our previous lecture. So explicitly, uh, we can, however, in sufficiently nice cases where we'll define sufficiently nice kind of as we go forward, we can find an implicit solution to one in this form here. Okay, and if we have time within this lecture video, in the second half of the lecture, we'll talk about integrating factors. If we don't get them, in, if we don't get to them in this video, we'll discuss them in the next video. Okay, so let's explore this concept, and we will do this by starting with an example. Show that this uh, implicitly defined function here is an implicit solution to this equation. So explicitly here I'm saying again that y such that y is, satis is a function that satisfies this equation is the solution to this differential equation, not that this equation itself is a solution, okay? So just be careful with that distinction. Okay, so looking at this, how would one go about showing that this is an implicit solution of this thing here? Well, if I just kind of look at this, this is not something I want to try to solve for y. Uh, we potentially could, but there's a mathematical theorem that says, generally speaking, we can't solve all equations of a uh, degree of five or higher, so that's a little disheartening. So how do we go about this uh, problem? 
Well, we can first recall that implicit differentiation is a thing, and we could just differentiate both sides of this equation. So here we have a choice. We could differentiate this with respect to x or with respect to y. And it doesn't matter which one we pick. We're going to get the same thing when we uh, differentiate it with either a factor of dy dx appearing somewhere or a factor of dx dy appearing somewhere. So let's just differentiate this thing here with respect to x. And again, that's just a choice. So we all know how to do implicit differentiation. So to save time, I'm just going to quickly write everything out, and then you can see the compilation of solving the problem. Okay, so now I'm going to collect all the terms that have a dy dx, and I'm going to collect all the terms that do not have a dy dx and put them together. So just doing that real quickly gives the expression found in the text. Okay, so from here, this thing isn't of this form exactly, right? Here I have a dy dx, here I have the dx and the dy. But I could multiply this whole expression by dx or rewrite this equation into the kind of this form here, and then you can just notice immediately that this expression here is the same expression that I have here, and this expression here is simply the same expression that I have here. So in fact, this does solve this differential equation. So now if you just notice in this example, this differential equation was of the form of this m of xy dx is equal to n of xy dy, right? And we could find a solution in this form. Well, we could verify that this was a solution to this differential equation. So the natural question to ask is, in which cases can I go from this thing here to a function of, or an implicit function of this form? And precisely how can I go, like how can I solve these differential equations? And in general, while it's quite difficult to explicitly quantify when I can solve differential equations of this form, it is, however, decently easy to find certain classes of equations of this form that I can readily solve. And that's what we're going to be discussing in this lecture. So in order to explore these type of differential equations, a good place to start is by taking this example here and generalizing it. So recall that if a function f, that's a function of x and y, and y is in turn a function of x, has first partial derivatives, then I can directly apply the chain rule to this expression here to see that, well, if I take the partial derivative of f with respect to x for the first term, I'll just have f sub x, and technically, dx dx, which is 1 sitting here, plus I'd have my f, the derivative of f with respect to y, times the derivative of y with respect to x, or just this y prime here, and the derivative of c, well, if c is a constant, that's just going to give me 0. So from here, I can rewrite this expression into the same form of the differential equations that I discussed earlier. Explicitly, I can write it out like this. Now, this term here has a name. In particular, the left-hand side of the expression, uh, so this term here, is just simply the total derivative or the exact differential of f with respect to x. In certain other contexts, namely fluid dynamics, it's also called the material derivative. So this has many physical applications. So explicitly, if, say, f is the velocity field of some fluid, then this expression here will if I replace x with time, it will simply tell me the acceleration of the fluid. But for the purposes of this lecture, this expression here gives us a way that we can start trying to tackle solving differential equations of this form here. So in particular, just tied to this nomenclature of the exact differential of f, we're going to call differential equations of this form exact equations. OK, so from the work here that we've done here and from the previous example, let's give a theorem. Theorem uh, 2.5.1. If f of x, comma y has continuous partial derivatives in some open rectangle, then this equation f of x, comma y is equal to c is an implicit solution of the exact differential equation. Okay, so here the idea of the proof for this theorem is basically just given by the above work here, but you can see the text for a formal proof. But there's nothing really fancy going on here. So what this theorem really lets me say is, hey, if I can find a differential equation of this form, and I can find a function f that satisfies this differential equation here, 
Then an implicit solution will simply be given by setting f of x comma y equal to some constant c. So that sounds pretty powerful, but it really doesn't tell us how to find f or how to determine if there is an f such that the differential equation can be written in this form. So let's look at a couple of open questions. So open questions for now. Given some differential equation of this form, how do I know when it's exact? Okay, and then further, if it is exact, how do I solve it? Well, let's look at this first question first and then tackle the second one. This uh, differential equation of this form will be exact precisely when it can be written in this form, right? That's the definition of an exact equation. Okay, so if I want to write something like this in this form, then it better be the case that there is some function f such that this f of x term here is simply equal to m, and this partial here is simply equal to m. So explicitly, we need there to be some potential function f, and potential is just the name that we give to functions that satisfy these properties, such that f of x is equal to m, and f sub y is equal to n on some open rectangle. And here we explicitly need to work on some open rectangle for the partial derivatives to even be a thing. So that's kind of why that's floating around there. Okay, so if we want to quantify this, we really want a theorem for when such a function f exists. Well, in general, this can be quite difficult to do. So let's make a few extra assumptions that are very useful. If m and n are c1, that is to say they're uh, have partial derivatives and the partial derivatives are continuous on some open rectangle, then we could differentiate them. And in particular, it becomes useful to differentiate m with respect to y and n with respect to x. So if we do that, we can write that f of xy is equal to m sub y and f sub yx is equal to n sub x. Okay, well, how does this help me? Well, if you recall Clarence's theorem from calculus, this tells us that if a function is C2, namely if a function has uh, continuous pa second partial derivatives, then the mixed partials have to be equal to each other. Okay, so if these mixed partials f of xy and f of yx are equal to each other, that's simply going to tell me that m sub y has to be equal to n sub x. Okay, so how does this all of this stuff help me? Well, this gives me a necessary condition, and actually it's sufficient on so-called simply connected domains, which I won't talk about those here, so you won't really need that. But it gives me a necessary condition for a differential equation to be exact. Okay, so let's turn this into a theorem. Suppose m and n are continuous and have continuous partial derivatives, explicitly these partials here, on some open rectangle r. So this open rectangle here is one of the key parts of this theorem. If you get rid of this open rectangle, then what? Then the rest of the theorem does not follow. Okay, so if this is true, then this differential equation here is going to be exact on this open rectangle if and only if the y derivative of m is equal to the x derivative of n for all of the points within that rectangle. Okay, so note that this is a precise quantification of when something is exact. Namely, this is an if and only if statement. Thus, if I want to show that an equation is exact, I can first show that this m and n have these continuous partial derivatives and that this statement here holds for all points within sub, some rectangle r. Now, the proof for this is beyond the scope of the class, so I'm not going to cover it. The text doesn't give it either. But the key idea is the work that we did over here is actually a sufficient condition on these so-called simply connected domains. And this domain here, an open rectangle, is an example of a simply connected domain. Okay, so if I give you a differential equation of this form, we can now determine whether or not it is exact. But this theorem doesn't tell us how to solve the equation. So in order to kind of give an illustration of how to use this theorem and how to solve an exact differential equation, differential equation, let's look at this example from the text. Well, modified example from the text. Is this differential equation exact on an open rectangle? Well, any open rectangle. And second, if it is exact, what is the largest domain for which it is exact? And what is the solution on that domain? Okay, so let's talk to Mr. Paint and dive right in. 
the first thing that we need to do is check to see if it's exact, right? So how do I test for exactness? Well, I need to identify what my m function is and what my n function is. So just recall that m is always going to be the function that's sitting here, and n is going to be the function over here. So from here, I simply get that m is equal to this and n is equal to that. So now I need to take the appropriate partial derivatives of m and n. So since m is associated with the dx, just recall that I want to compute m sub y. So here I compute m sub y. And on the other side, since n is related to this, tied to this dy term, I take n of the other partial. So if I do this, straightforward calculations give And thus, I have that m sub y is equal to n sub x. And this equality here holds everywhere. So since this is true for all points x, comma y, and r2, that tells me that this equation is going to be exact on all of r2. Thus, the answer to this qu second question here, if it is, what's the largest domain? The largest domain is simply going to be r2. Okay, so now I know that it's exact everywhere, but how does that actually help me to find the solution? Well, since it's exact, I know that it's going to be written of the form f sub x dx plus f sub y dy is simply going to be equal to zero. So this tells me that this m function is equal to f of x and this uh, n function is equal to f of y. So explicitly, And theorem 2.5.1 tells us that if I can find a uh, potential function f that satisfies these two conditions, then I'm done. So how am I going to do that? Well, I can pick either one of these equations and integrate them with respect to x or y respectively to find what f is up to a arbitrary function that will depend on the other variable. So let's do that and then talk about what the second step would be. So just kind of arbitrarily picking this function here, which you could pick the other one, it doesn't matter what you pick. If I pick this and I integrate, this is what I get. And just for clarity here, I get an arbitrary function with respect to y, since I'm integrating a function that depends on both x and y with respect to x, so any arbitrary function of y is fine here. Okay, so now I have a functional form for f, but instead of having an arbitrary uh, constant, I have this arbitrary function that depends on y. So the natural question is, how do I get rid of this arbitrary function of y? Well, if you notice here, I only used one of these two uh, things that need to hold for my function f, right? I only have that its x derivative is this but I also need that its y derivative is equal to this term here. So if I take the y derivative of this function here, set it equal to this, and then solve for that arbitrary constant, then I can figure out what that arbitrary constant needs to be. And here when I say constant, I really mean arbitrary function of y. Okay, so let's clean this up a little bit and then we will do that. Okay, so now doing a straightforward calculation, which I'll also speed up, I can compute that the partial derivative of f with respect to y is simply going to be equal to this expression here. Okay, and now this needs to be equal to the expression that I have over here. So explicitly using this for this equality, I know that needs to be equal to... Okay, and here it's pretty obvious that this term cancels with this term here. So I end up getting that the c prime of y has to be equal to 6y squared. Or simply, uh, c of y has to be equal to this expression here. So now, if I take this and I plug it into this function here for f, I get my final solution is f is equal to this expression here, where I replace c of y with 2y cubed. So explicitly... Okay, and our final answer is this term right here. Okay, so it's a little bit messy here, so let's clean it up like so. So given that I have an equation that is in that correct form to be an exact equation, all I have to do to solve the equation 
is simply do these direct co computations here where I just evaluate a couple of intervals. And do note, it doesn't matter which one of these that I chose to integrate first, at least mathematically speaking. I could have started with uh, doing purple, evaluating it to get a new expression where I have c of x instead of c of y, and then I would simply use green along with uh, this red square here to evaluate what c of x should be, and then plug them together to get the final solution like so. Now, while mathematically you can use one way or the other, sometimes one of these expressions will be easier to evaluate than the other, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so it turns out that this method works in general, so let's give an algorithm for how to approach these type of problems. Okay, so here again, if you want to see this kind of written out in trench, uh, it's this example 2.5.3, and they actually show how to do it both ways, where you do it the way that I did here, or where you do it the way where you integrate the purple box for with respect to y first. So check that out if you want to see another, like this example worked out in a bit more detail there. Okay, so again, previous example motivates this algorithm. First, we check to see if this equation is exact. If it's not, we stop. Stop it. If it is, then we can apply our algorithm that we just did. Namely, we first integrate this uh, expression here with respect to x. And once we do that, we'll find an expression of the form f of x comma y is equal to g of x comma y plus phi of y. And here, g of x comma y is just any antiderivative of m with respect to t, and this phi of y is some unknown function. So generally speaking, you'll pick g of x comma y to be the antiderivative of m, where you just integrate everything out and don't add in that arbitrary function, and you let this uh, phi of y control for all the arbitrary function stuff. It's quite similar to when you integrate a expression with respect to x when it only depends on x, you generally don't add an, or a particular constant to it and you just pick that arbitrary constant. That said, you can, and in some cases it's useful. Uh, one post on Piazza, namely this post here where I cut it out so you couldn't see the name of the student to keep them anonymous, uh, they actually picked a particular value for the constant by writing this thing here as x minus 2 instead of x. So what this allows them to do is have a little bit easier of a time when applying the initial conditions because the initial conditions were applied at 2. So while you could do that here, generally speaking, you just integrate it and leave it as it is. Okay, now that we have this functional form of f, f at this point only satisfies the first condition that it's partial with respect to x is equal to this m function. We therefore differentiate this expression here with respect to y, and then after we do this, we set that equal to this expression for n here, and then ultimately solve for this unknown function phi prime of y. So once we are at this stage, we then want to integrate both sides with respect to y, and once we do this, we can find phi uh, and substi simply substitute that into this expression here. And that then gives us this function f that would satisfy two conditions. Firstly, that when I take its x derivative, I get m of x. And secondly, when I take its uh, y derivative, I get n. Okay, so at that point, our solution would then be y of x such that f of x comma y is equal to a constant. If you drop this last step here, you do not have a solution. Uh, in particular, this f of x comma y does not solve the differential equation. y, such that f of x comma y is equal to c, is the thing that solves the differential equation. And that's coming from our theorem 2.5.2. Now, generally speaking, and for this course, if you can, you should solve this for y of x explicitly. If it's a nice expression, I'll, I will want you to solve it. But if it's something awful like, say, a quadratic or a cubic in terms of y, then you can just leave it in terms of uh, the implicit expression here. Okay, so one thing, note that in step two, you again can integrate this expression with respect to y instead of the expression that we did in this algorithm with respect to x and then adjust the rest of the steps accordingly if it is easier. We will give an example of this in a second on the next slide. So before I go to the next slide, I want to introduce one alternative method that can be easier to use uh, depending on the exact case. 
So first we check for exactness. Again, if it's not exact, stop. And then we integrate n with respect to y and m with respect to x, ignoring the constant functions for both of these two things. Okay, once I have these two expressions, I can then just compare the results of the two expressions in step two. So I'd have uh, f is equal to some function and f is equal to another function. I just look at those two functions that I have. And then I let the f of x comma y be the function that contains all of the terms that appear in the two different expressions that I had. And explicitly, we do not want to repeat any common terms between the two. Okay, and then from there, we finally let f of x comma y equal c, and we do a little happy dance because we're done. So here I'll explain exactly how this works via example in two slides from now. So you'll see it as an alternative method. You don't have to use it, but in the case where these two integrals are easy to compute, it can be a little bit quicker to use this alternative method. Okay, so explicitly in practice, this alternative method is only really easier if you can integrate both n and m relatively quickly. If one of them is hard to do, then use the uh, method number one. Okay, let's look at one more example. Solve this differential equation here. So let's go over to Mr. Paint and take a look at this. Okay, so I want to follow my procedure for solving an exact equation to solve this. So the first thing I do is I let this thing here be equal to m, and I let this thing here be equal to n. Okay, so explicitly I write this out. And I now want to test for exactness by differentiating m with respect to y and n with respect to x and seeing if they are continuous and they are equal to each other. So let's do this. And pretty clearly, these two expressions are equal because all the terms match. Therefore, I can conclude that m sub y is equal to n sub x, and thus the function is exact. Okay, so now that I know that the de exact, the next thing I need to do is set up the equations that I want to solve, or technically I could just jump in, but generally speaking, it's kind of useful to take a look at them and write them down just for future reference. So explicitly, I want to find a function f such that the x partial is equal to m and the y partial is equal to n. Okay, so now we have a decision to make. Do I use algorithm one or algorithm two? So if I want to use algorithm two, for instance, I need to integrate both of these expressions. Well, if I look at this in terms of x, there's a lot going on here, right? I have this e to the x thing here, tangent of x, that product, e to the x and secant of x, that product. So I'd have to use integration by parts to evaluate this, and that's gonna be a little bit messy. On the other hand, if I just look at this function, uh, the only dependence on y that it has is entirely sitting here in this e to the x times y term, and that's being multiplied by a factor of x, so that's just a simple u substitution. So, I really don't wanna use method two here, since I would then have to evaluate both of these integrals. And if I go to use method one, which I'm going to do, I don't really want to start with integrating this f of x term because that's pretty god awful if we're being honest. So instead, I'll integrate this f sub y term and then hopefully things will be not too bad when I go to satisfy the f sub x uh, expression there. So let's do this. Okay, now that I have f as this function here, I then want to use the other condition that I have not used yet. So just briefly color coding things a bit, I want to use this blue equation here. So from here, using the blue equation, this would then give me 
Okay, so here it's pretty obvious that this term here, the secant squared term, cancels with the secant squared term here, and that this term here, the tangent term, cancels with this tangent term here. Thus, we can conclude that this g prime of x function is simply going to be equal to zero. And therefore, integrating both sides with respect to x simply gives me that this g of x term is just going to be some arbitrary constant c. Thus, putting all of this together, I have that f of x comma y. This is simply going to be equal to this expression that I found here, the tangent of x plus e to the xy, plus some arbitrary constant, which we will set to zero trivially. And therefore, our solution will simply be this thing here is equal to some arbitrary constant. So the final answer for this case will simply be the thing in this yellow box here. That is an implicit solution. Now in this case, this isn't particularly awful to solve for y alone, but it is not the nicest thing having c divided by tangent of x and then taking ln of everything there and then dividing that by x. So I'm just going to leave this as this expression here. So as you can see from this example, there's a little bit of creativity that can be involved in trying to pick the optimal way to find one of these solutions. And in general, that would be true throughout this course, because at this point, uh, if I give you an arbitrary differential equation, you could use, potentially at least, any of these three methods that we've covered to try to solve it. Okay, so here's that work in slide form. And let's go on by looking at an example of using the second method. So to show how the alternate alternative method works, let's re-examine this problem here. So going over to paint, this is the thing that we want to solve. So we've already done some of the work for this before, so let's just copy over that work that we've done just to save a little bit of time here. Okay, so previously we found that this is an exact equation everywhere, and we found that f of x needs to satisfy this uh, term here, and f of y needs to satisfy that term here. Now previously we used the method one to solve this, but if we just look at these two expressions, those are just polynomials, right? So both of these are really easy to integrate, so let's just do that this time. So from here, from green, we have where we don't know what this phi function is, and from purple we have where again, we don't know that phi sub x function. So from here, all we have to do is compare these two solutions and see what they have in common. So explicitly, both of these have this term sitting here. And outside of that, they don't have anything else in common, but they do have uh, oops, this extra term x cubed here and this extra term 2y squared here. So our final solution for f would need to be a function that contains all three of these terms. So what we can simply do is build that function by letting f simply be equal to this term in blue, so this x to the fourth y cubed, plus I can pick this phi of x function to be this term in the light green here, plus this psi sub y function will simply be this term here. And then of course from here, my solution would simply be this thing is equal to some constant. And we can box that in blue. So here you can kind of see this method of uh, just integrating both of them and then kind of comparing the terms can be a little bit less tedious in some sense, but only if both of these functions are easy to integrate. So just keep this in mind as an extra way that you can potentially approach these problems if they're sufficiently nice to integrate. Okay, so this video has actually made a lot better time than I thought it would, so let's continue from here. So where are we at this point? Well, previously I started this lecture with this picture with the green circle and the red circle. We've now added this blue circle here where if we can show that the equation is exact, then we can do this process where we integrate and eliminate the unknown function. And this process here will work because this exactness condition always will guarantee that once I get to this step and eliminate everything out, 
I will simply have that the unknown function is equal to some function that depends only on the variable that of the unknown function. I won't get something that depends on x and y here. Uh, on the other hand, if this exact condition doesn't always hold, then that method will break down at that point. So previously, when we were working with equations of these two forms here, we found that sometimes we could take an equation that wasn't of that form and do some quick transformations to put it into that form. This begs the question, can I do this for equations that aren't exact? Namely, can I make a non-exact differential equation into an exact equation? And well, the answer to that is sometimes. So let's kind of discuss this a little bit. Note that if I have a function mu that depends on x and y that is non-zero, then I can take this equation here and I can multiply both sides by mu to get an equivalent expression. So explicitly, if I have this function that's non-zero, then the expression for an exact equation can also be expressed like this. Well, how does this help me? Well, if I can find an appropriate integrating factor mu, that's what we're going to call these uh, functions mu, such that I can take a non-exact e uh, differential equation and turn it into an exact differential equation, then I can make a non-exact equation exact. How do I go about doing this, though? How do I find this mu? Well, recall that this function here is exact if and only if the y derivative of m is equal to the x derivative of n. Therefore, this equation here will be exact only when the x derivative of this term is equal to the y derivative of this term. Okay, so here, using the product rule, I can expand out these partial derivatives, and I can say that this equation here is going to be exact if and only if this quantity here holds. Thus, if I can solve this equation here for mu, then I can make the equation exact. Now notice, if the equation that I started out with was exact, so namely, if my m and n over here were such that my x derivative of n is equal to my y derivative of m, then I can simply use mu is equal to 1 to, as an integrating factor to make, quote, make the differential equation exact, right? Explicitly, these terms here would vanish, and I'd simply get nx is equal to my. But that's kind of the degenerate case there. Unfortunately, in general, trying to find mu for an equation that wasn't initially exact is hard. So what we're going to do is we're going to make some assumptions on mu that don't let us find all of the integrating factors for all potential differential equations that could be turned into an exact differential equation, but it does work for a large class of equations. So what am I going to do with mu? Well, I'm going to assume that mu is separable. That is to say, mu can be written of this form here. Well, so how does this help me? Well, if mu can be written like this, I can plug this expression into this equation here, and I can simplify things out a little bit. So if I do that, this is what I get directly. Uh, computing the x derivative would give me this uh, p prime q times n, which I put over here on this side of the equation. Uh, and then here I just get p times q times x. And over here, I would simply get p q prime m from this term here. And finally, p q m sub y from this term here. So now, if I take this whole expression here, and I assume that mu is non-zero, which is my starting point as well, I could simply divide this whole thing through by p times q and rearrange it. If I do that, this expression becomes this slightly more useful expression here. So notice to go from here to here, I'm explicitly taking this uh, term here and subtracting it off, so I get this term minus this term, where dividing by pq makes the pq go away, is simply equal to this term divided by pq minus this term over here. Okay, and finally, I can give these functions here a name, little p of x and little q of y respectively. Okay, again, the natural question. I just did this thing that I could do, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Should I actually do this? Or in other words, how does this actually help me? Well, if I can find functions p of x and q of y that satisfy this expression here, 
then I have two ODEs, right? I have this ODE uh, P pri capital P prime of X divided by P of X is equal to a little p of X, which we know how to solve. And the other ODE, Q prime of X over Q is equal to little Q. So we could solve these PDE or ODEs for uh, capital P of X and capital Q of X respectively, and that would give us mu. So what I've really accomplished by doing all of these computations and making this assumption here is to turn the problem from the problem of finding a mu such that this partial differential equation, explicitly this forced wave equation for mu holds into the simpler, quote simpler, problem of finding p and q such that this expression here holds, and then simply integrating to compute what my capital P and capital Q are, and then plugging them in into mu. Well, the expression for mu to find mu. Again, in general, it can be hard to find these functions p of x and q of y, but oftentimes one can find a easy way to solve for p of x or q of y. So again, just big TLDR, starting with an equation that's non-exact, if I make this assumption on the form of the integrating factor, then I can greatly reduce the difficulty in trying to find the integrating factor. Unlike some of the assumptions that we've made, such as the assumption in lecture one that uh, in using the variation of parameters, I could just pick an arbitrary particular one of the solutions to the complementary equation, this assumption on mu actually reduces the scope upon which this method is valid. So just keep that in mind that in general, you actually legitimately do need to solve this equation, but that's beyond the scope of this class and is legitimately a hard math problem to solve. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at a particular case where uh, finding this integrating factor is quite easy to do, to be honest. So let's solve the exactness equation here for P of X, okay? So in solving this for P of X, I'm just going to get an expression that would be valid for P of X, but sadly that expression will depend on this Q of Y. So in general, it won't give me all of the possible P of X's for every case. Okay, so straightforward calculation. If I solve this for P of X, I would simply add this term over and then divide by N. So again here, when I divide by N, you need to be a little bit careful. And if N of X, Y is equal to zero at any particular point, then those singularities need to be carefully thought about. But that is a future us problem. And we've actually already dealt with the case where I have a singularity when we've discussed previous differential equations. So you'll see what I mean in a bit. Okay, so now if, if, this is again an assumption, this term here does not depend on y, then nice things happen. What nice things happen? Well, it turns out that this expression here can't depend on y. Why? Well, p of x only depends on x, right? So since the right-hand side is the sum of two functions, uh, in turn, which depend potentially on x and y, if this uh, part of the function here can't depend on y, then this part can't depend on y as well, because if it did, then this sum would depend on y, which again, it can't, because the sum is equal to p of x, which doesn't depend on y. Okay, that means this whole expression here cannot depend on y, which then means that q of y has to be a constant. Now, it turns out that we can pick q of y to explicitly be equal to zero. Now again, this is a choice, but if I go back to the original problem, this term over here, I just wanna find a single p of x and a single q of y such that this expression holds, okay? So if it works out that uh, this q of y is equal to zero works, then I'm good. And spoiler alert, it does work. Okay, so if q of y is equal to zero, then this expression here explicitly will tell me that p of x has to be equal to this thing here, plus zero, or just this expression here. Okay, and if I pick this value for p of x, then very clearly, this will satisfy the condition for exactness, this equation over here, purely because the way that I found this expression for p of x was solving the exactness equation for p of x. Yay, we did it. Thus, I can compute this mu uh, is equal to p of x times q of y, where 
this p prime divided by p is simply equal to p of x or this expression here and for my other ODE, I get Q prime divided by Q is equal to zero. Okay, so just kind of a brief recap. We already know how to solve these two equations. They're just first order linear equations. I literally integrate both sides for with respect to X. Uh, and then I, on one side, I'll get this ln of the absolute value of P or ln of absolute value of Q respectively. And I just take the exponential of both sides. So explicitly, the solutions are simply going to be p of x is equal to some arbitrary constant times e to the integral of p of x dx. And on the other side, I'll have q of x is equal to c2 e to the integral of 0 dy, or simply c3. Now previously, when we divided by n over here, well, over here, I said we needed to be careful to deal with potential singularities of n. Well, here's where we can handle the potential singularities of n. We already know how to solve equations like this where we have a potential singularity. We literally just avoid the singularity and restrict our interval of validity to avoid the singularity. So that's precisely how we handle those singularities if they exist. And again, sometimes you get a singularity in the intermediary steps, and then at the end, it doesn't matter because everything's smooth. Okay, so now, now that we found this P and Q, we can construct a bunch of different potential integrating factors mu. But keep in mind, we only need one integrating factor for mu. So I'm simply going to let mu of x comma, comma y be equal to p times q, where I just pick the values of these coefficients constants to be equal to one. Okay, and here this choice of picking the integrating factor to be particularly this integrating factor doesn't actually restrict the validity of this method just like it didn't when we did variation of parameters. Okay, one more thing to note, a similar expression holds if I repeat all of this analysis, but for Q of Y instead of P of X. So explicitly here, I solve this equation for Q of Y. I then assume that the equivalent term here would not depend on Y, or sorry, X instead of Y, and then I would get similar differential equations that I could solve. So sometimes you can get an integrating factor by going one way. Other times you can get the integrating factor by going the other way. It really just depends on the problem and whether or not you can integrate to uh, get these integrals here or whether or not these terms here are actually don't depend on the other variable. Okay, so let's take all of this work that we did and put it into a theorem. Okay, so theorem 2.6.1, if n, m, n sub y and n sub x are continuous in an open rectangle R. And here, again, I need these things to be continuous on an open rectangle R in order for everything to be properly defined to have the exact equation in the step where I use the Clarence theorem for that to be valid. But if we have this nice property, then two things occur. One, if this is independent of y on that region R, then this term here where this p of x is defined as follows is going to be an integrating factor on r for this equation here. So to be explicit, if I take this equation and I multiply it by mu of x, it would then be an exact equation if this thing is independent of y. And further, I can do the, the exact same process but with respect to x. So if this quantity here is independent of x on r, then this factor here, where this q of y is now going to be defined as follows, is an integrating factor on r for this equation here. Again, if I took take this equation and evaluate this mu and multiply that equation by mu, that would then be an exact equation. Okay, and unlike many of the other theorems throughout this course, this is one that I just suggest you kind of sit down and memorize. It's not super bad to kind of drive it, but it is kind of a bit long. So yeah, it's ultimately up to you, but you do need to know this method. Okay, let's go to one final example before we end this lecture. Okay, going over to Mr. Paint. Let's try to solve this equation. So the first thing we wanna do is check to see if this is exact. If it is, I'm good to go. Oh, so this expression is not exact. So next we can compute m sub y minus n sub x. And the reason why we just straightforward compute this is because here this appears either with a change of sign. So let's just compute it real quick. 
Okay, so for this method of finding an integrating factor to work, it needs to be the case that my minus nx divided by m and n respectively only depend on y or x respectively, right? Either this is true or this is true. So for this case, is either one of those true? Well, just kind of eyeballing it. Here, I could rewrite this by simply pulling out a factor of negative 2x. So doing that, I could rewrite this as minus 2x times x squared y squared plus, uh, with a 3 here, plus a factor of 4 times y. Okay, so here, this is exactly what n was. So if I take this and divide it by n, I'm just going to get negative 2x. That is only a function of x, so I can use this technique to find an integrating factor. So before we go on, do note that if I take this whole expression here and divide it by this complex term here, I can't actually get an expression that only depends on y. So in this case, I can only use this uh, term first method here to actually find the integrating factor. Okay, so going back from here, I would simply note that my minus nx all divided by n is simply equal to minus 2x. Thus, and since I'm explicitly using the theorem here to prove this, I would want to say thus uh, theorem 2.6.1 a tells me that if my p of x is defined to be this minus 2x, then this mu of x is equal to e to the integral of p of x dx is an integrating factor for the original differential equation. Okay. So now all I have to do is evaluate this integral. That's pretty straightforward to do. The integral of negative 2x with respect to x is simply going to be negative x squared plus a constant. I can ignore the constant in this case. So from here I have mu is simply going to be equal to e to the minus x squared. Okay, so let's clean this up a little bit before we continue. Okay, so now what we do is we take this whole differential equation and we multiply it by mu. So here I'm just going to copy the equation from the text, kind of a little bit cleaner to see it from there. So thus, this is our new equation that will be an exact equation. Word of caution here, uh, if you want to, it's a good idea to check your work to make sure you did not make an error uh, in computing this integrating integration factor. Uh, that said, if you're confident that your uh, work had no issue, then you could assume this is exact and just try to solve it with that assumption. If your assumption is wrong, you will run into an issue when you go to try to solve for the second uh, term. Okay, so we now just apply the method that we did previously to try to solve exact differential equations. To solve this, we want to have, find a potential function f that has two properties. One, its x derivative will be equal to this. So explicitly, f of x needs to be equal to this expression here, and its y derivative will be equal to the other term. So explicitly, this other expression here. Okay, so from here, we could apply method 1 or method 2. Eyeballing it, we have this e to the x squared term that we have to integrate over. So if I integrate this with respect to x in order to evaluate this, I need to do a u substitution, and there better be a factor of negative 2x that I can grab. So if I kind of eyeball this, there's an x in each one of these terms. So I could even integrate this with respect to x if I so chose, but I would have to do a u substitution for each one of these terms, and for some of these I'd have to do an integration by parts. That's kind of annoying. On the other hand, if I look at this, if I integrate it with respect to y, the e to the x squared term is a constant, so that's just basically doing an, the integral of a polynomial. So here I'm going to choose to do method 1 as opposed to method 2, just to avoid integrating this kind of annoying expression there. Again, that's a choice. It is integrable analytically in this case with 
without too much work. So you could use method two if you wanted to, or method one where you integrate this term here. But integrating this expression here, what does that give us? Well, it gives me this. Okay, so now I want to solve for this phi of x term. So in order to solve for the phi of x term, I'm going to use the data from this purple square here. So purple, along with the work that I've just did, will imply that this holds here. Okay, so comparing these two terms, we can see that a fair bit of cancellation occurs. Explicitly, this term cancels with the other term over here. Next up, this term cancels with this term here. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Uh, this term here. And finally, this term cancels with this term. So all of this together simplifies to say that phi prime of x is simply going to be equal to this 2x e to the negative x squared term. Pretty straightforwardly, if I integrate this, I get that phi is equal to, well, here I do a u substitution with u as, say, negative x squared. My du would then be negative 2x dx. So evaluating that out from here, I would simply get that phi is going to be equal to negative e to the minus x squared. And of course, you should show your work when doing that. And of course, there is an arbitrary constant here, but we don't need the arbitrary constant since we're going to set f of x equal comma y equal to an arbitrary constant anyways. So from here, we can finally conclude that f of x comma y, this thing is going to simply be equal to the expression that I found over here. So explicitly this, stole it from the book, and my exact solutions will be when this is equal to some arbitrary constant c. Okay, so kind of just taking a look back and examining this. Basically, what we did is we had a function that was not exact to start with. So we checked for an integrating factor using this technique. It so turned out that this technique worked, and we did find an integrating factor explicitly, this term here, this e to the minus x squared. And once we found that integrating factor, we just plugged it, well, multiply the equation by it. We didn't check for exactness. It's a good idea to check just to see if you made an error or not. But since we uh, did this method, if we didn't make any errors, it would then be exact. So we simply applied the method to try to solve it as if it were an exact equation. And along the way, we found a differential equation for phi prime, and this differential equation on the left-hand side did in fact only depend on x. That's the sign that we did everything correctly. So then we solved that for phi, and then finally found our solution for the differential equation. Okay, so it's a bit involved, but it, again, is not as involved as trying to solve that uh, partial difference equation for uh, mu. Okay, and do note, if this method fails, if this theorem doesn't actually give us a, a solution or an integrating factor to find the solution, that does not imply that there is no integrating factor to find a solution. It just implies that the integrating factor that you found is not separable. So in practice, to actually show that there is no integrating factor, you need to show that there is no solution to that partial difference equation. Beyond the scope of the class, don't worry about it for now. Okay, so just wrapping up, I want you to read sections 2.5 and 2.6. It goes through everything I stated here. Some bits don't have as much detail, uh, and I did a little bit more driving than was in the text. So yeah, but still, they do the formal proofs there. Uh, and then for practice, I want you to look at these equa these questions here for exact quest uh, questions, and these uh, questions here for ones where you can find an exact question. Okay, and finally, we will leave you with a meme. Non-exact equations, you can't defeat me. I know, but he can, maybe. Uh, and then we have arbitrary, well, these integrating factors that we found uh, here. Okay, so again, have a wonderful day. I wish you all the best. If you have questions, Piazza's always open and so are office hours.